अहम बंदे सरने न सह पंचान शीला ने चाम द्वितीय पे अहम बंदे सरने न सह पंच शीला ने चाम तृतीय पे अहम बंदे सरने न सह पंच शीला ने चाम नमो तस्स भगवतो अरहतो सम्मा संबुधस 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 बुद्धं शरणं गच्छामि बुद्धं शरणं गच्छामि धम्मं शरणं गच्छामि धम्मं शरणं गच्छामि संघं शरणं गच्छामि संघं शरणं गच्छामि संघं शरणं गच्छामि तृतीयं पि बुद्धं शरणं गच्छामि शरण समाधि समाधि शील साधुसा Here he addressed the bhikkhus thus, bhikkhus, when you will serve the reply. The blessed one said this, bhikkhus, Sariputta is wise. Sariputta has great wisdom. Sariputta has wide wisdom. Sariputta has joyous wisdom. Sariputta has quick wisdom. Sariputta has keen wisdom. Sariputta has penetrating wisdom. During half a month, bhikkhus. So he took the insight into the states one by one as they occurred. Now, so he took his insight into states one by one as they occurred was this. So, just to point out that the word here is 
ಅನುಪಾದ ಧಮ್ಮ ವಿಪಾಸನ್ ಅನುಪಾದ ಧಾಮ ವಿಪಾಸನ ವಿಪಸತಿ ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ರೇರ್ ಎಕ್ಸಾಂಪಲ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಆಕ್ಚುಯಲ್ ಫಾರ್ಮ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ವರ್ಡ್ ವಿಪಾಸನ ಯುಸ್ ಗೈನ್ ಅ ಸಿ ಸಮ್ ಹಿಂಟ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಆಬಿ ಧಮ್ಮ ಇನ್ ಸುಟ್ಟ ವಿಚ್ ಇಸ್ ಇಂಟ್ರೆಸ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಸಾರಿ ಪುಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಒನ್ ಹೂಸ್ ಕ್ರೆಡಿಟೆಡ್ ವಿತ್ formulating the abhidhamma into the form that we have it based on the teachings he received directly from the Buddha. So this is sort of a hint of the Buddha's relationship, the Buddha and sorry, Buddha's relationship and how it evolved. So sort of this, the kinds of understanding that we find in the abhidhamma. Bante Anupada Anupada Dhamma Vipassana Yeah. Uh does that mean um like insights uh, successive ordering to insights or um no not exactly it's um it's related to the uh the nature of arising and ceasing basically I mean, you'll see when you'll see how he explains it in the sutta it also relates to samatha and and no i suppose it doesn't relate to samatha but it relates to the the nature of um reality in terms of cause and effect there's uh, i mean it doesn't go into any of the details of the vipassana jnanas for example but that's pretty much implied in a lot of these suttas there is not the sort of technical detail because the buddha is giving a talk and so he's describing something fairly general but the idea is that while well, starting with namarupa prachedanyana and pachya parigahanyana there's an understanding of the nature of reality as being momentary and the cause of relationship between those momentary realities. Claudia? Here, bhikkhus, quite secluded from sensual pleasure, secluded from unwholesome state, Sariputta entered upon and abide in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. And the state in the first jhana, the applied thought, the sustained thought, the rapture, the pleasure, and the unification of the mind, the contact, feeling, perception, volition, and mind, the zeal, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention. The states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him, those states arose. Known, they were present. Known, they disappeared. He understood thus. So, indeed, the states, not having been, come into being. Having been, they vanish. Regarding those states, he abided unattracted, unrepelled, independent, detached, free, disassociated. With the mind rid of barriers, he understood. There is an escape behind, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. So this is the sort of uh, description relating to the three characteristics. Even though he doesn't mention the three characteristics, it's another way of describing what's important to understand. Because in, implicit in this is the the point that there is no self involved there is no uh, satisfaction to be had in any of these things and they are imper- of course impermanent they are rising and ceasing so the this sort of insight is the sort of thing that would lead to um attainment of well the higher stages of knowledge and even becoming a sotapanna remember sorry but at this time was already a sotapanna but more importantly his his um determination was to become uh the number one uh right hand 
monk of the Buddha, he had a high attainment, and it was his uh, in attainment, his intention that most likely required him to have this in-depth understanding of going through all of the jhanas and uh, Nirodha Samapati. But that's what's happening here, is he's gaining precise clarity in regards to basically the three characteristics, or another way of putting it into the arising and ceasing. The nature of reality is arising and ceasing. Uh, Bante, he um, he was a, a rare person who can who could see the, these chetasikas right separately, actually, not not in the all in. Yeah, I mean, many of them are going to arise at the same time. He was able yeah. to discern qualities of the mind. Yeah, that's sort of what I... the Buddha is pointing out is how. How powerful is his clarity of mind, his strength of mind to be able to see things arising moment after moment. Or just to distinguish these qualities, I guess, because they are there in, in one citta, but just to being able to separate them out. That's yeah, and I mean, the, yeah. They're not each momentary jitta would be different, so being able to see the difference from one moment to the next and the qualities mm -hmm. that make up. Chetasikas can be mind objects, right? So uh, mind can take a chetasika mm -hmm. as an object uh, at one point, even though at that moment the other chetasikas are involved, the mind is taking that chetasika specifically. Really? as the object, like knowing this, focusing on one thing, like, for example, uh, you, even when we meditate, like, uh, when we feel something hard, we focus mm -hmm. on the hardness, you know, in the hardness, even though there's other jetasikas involved in that moment. That, that well, the specific hardness, isn't moment. The, hardness isn't the jetasika, but you're probably right. Yeah, that's, 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 that's just uh, like an uh, example of rupa. Focusing on well, you can. I mean, you you can focus on vedana. Vedana is a vedana is a jeta sticker, right? Yeah. Yes. And you can focus on vedana. So you, you think, Sankar, that vedana. that's how? I mean, uh, they are, they are called. Uh, I mean, the jeta sticker are said to be. Uh, uh, what is can be uh, said, said to be things that can be object uh, mm -hmm. in a thought, right? I mean, you you certainly can notice one uh, different jeta because I mean, of course, obviously things like sadha you can recognize samadhi, you can recognize mirya, you can recognize. So clearly, it's the case that the mind can and take these can things as an object. I'm not. I'm not quite sure if it's technically taking them as the object, but whatever you, practically speaking, you can be aware, right, that one or another is present. So it's not. It's not all that remarkable, as a principle. What Sariputta was doing. It's remarkable. That I think the clarity and the way the Buddha describes it as being so precise. Mm -hmm. Also, also th those are the. Um, prominent chetasikas we are talking about them. there are like uh, many chetasikas that uh, could be hard to uh, like focus on mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in hard to recognize yeah, hard to recognize like when a Sariputta can uh, recognize them all that's yes again because with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, Sariputta entered and abided in the second jhana, which has self-confidence self -confidence and singleness of mind, without applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of concentration. And these states in the second jhana, the self-confidence, the rapture, the pleasure, and the unification of mind, 
the contact, feeling, perception, volition, and mind, the zeal, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention, these states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him, those st states arose. Known they, they were present, known they disappeared. He under understood thus, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. Again, because with the fading away as were of rapture, Sariputta ad abided in equanimity and mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasure with the body, he entered upon and abided in the third jhana, on account of which noble ones announce, he has a pleasant abiding, who has equanimity and is mindful. And the states in the third jhana, the equanimity, the pleasure, the mindfulness, the full awareness, and the unification of mind, the contact, feeling, perception, volition, and mind, the zeal, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him those states arose, Known they were present, none they disappeared. He understood thus. And with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. Nine, again bhikkhus, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the fourth jhana which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. And the states in the fourth jhana, the equanimity, the neither painful, painful nor pleasant feeling, the mental unconcern due to tranquility, the purity of mindfulness, and the unification of mind, the contact, feeling, perception, volition, and mind, the zeal, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention, these states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him those states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared, he understood thus. And with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. Again, because with the complete surmounting of perceptions of form, with the disappearance of perceptions of sensory impact, with non-attention to perceptions of diversity, aware that space is infinite, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the base of infinite space. And the states in the base of infinite space the perception of the base of infinite space and the unification of mind, the contact, feeling, perception, volition, and mind, the zeal, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention, these states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him, those states arose. Known they were present, known they disappeared. He understood thus, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. 30. Again, because by completely surmounting the base of infinite space, aware that consciousness is infinite, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the base of infinite consciousness, and the states in the base of infinite consciousness, the perception of the base of infinite consciousness, and the unification of mind, the contact, feeling, perception, volition and mind, the zeal, decision, energy, 
mindfulness, equanimity, and attention. These states were, were defined by him one by one as they occurred, known to him, those states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. He understood thus, with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. I don't really understand what this concept is, this infinite consciousness. I do understand the other ones for some reason, but this one, I think I never really understood. Like, what, what, how, how can I understand this um, infinite consciousness? Well, the easiest way to understand it is based on infinite space, because the consciousness that uh, takes infinite space as an object has an infinite boundary or has a, an infinite I don't know what the right word is an infinite uh, field it has an infinity about it so the perception of con of space being infinite has to has to encompass uh, an infinite uh, field everything and so what happens is you let go of the actual space and you just take the act that the very consciousness that was conscious of the infinite space as the object you focus on your awareness the fact that you're aware infinitely so it's not uh, related to time or anything like that no it's 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 related to space. It's about being aware infinitely with no bounds. So yeah, you have this, I, sense, I, this sense of 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 universal awareness or awareness that is infinite because of having been aware of, or, or based on having been aware of a of a an object that was infinite, infinite space. So imagine that when you attain the uh, fourth jhana based on a casino, like a disc. So when you attain the fourth jhana, it, it can uh, cover the entire. Uh, there's nothing else in your world. It's well, what a, you do is you 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 practice expanding it and contracting it, making it bigger and making it smaller, and eventually you get to the point where you make it infinitely big. You just continue to expand it until you have a sense of it being infinite. It's but just uh, in, in in case of a casino, the infinite uh, part of it is uh, has no color or anything, right? Well, at first it's an infinite casino, and then you're still in the fourth jhana. But then you become aware you you become aware that the casino is taking up infinite space. You have this sense of the infinitude of the casino, and then you just take that mm -hmm. infinitude as an object, and that's infinite space. And then the color drops away. Mm -hmm. So that's akasa uh, nanchayatana. And then you let go yes. of the space, and you're just aware of the consciousness that was aware of the infinite space. And then it's vinya uh, nanchayatana. But then once you drop that, then you get into nati kinchi akinchanya yatana. Nothing, nothingness. Because, well, mm -hmm. at that point, there's you've let go of the last thing. And then there's nothing. Okay, thank you so much. She might Mantra, explain this all this in the in the Abhidhamma. This was all explained to me the first time by her Abhidhamma teacher, so she might get into that eventually. I don't know if it's part of the curriculum. Uh, I I I mean I probably um, am curious about this because I haven't tried these things like these objects. Um, as my meditation object, but also when when I thought about uh, just for for seconds or minutes to try it, I couldn't understand the infinite consciousness part because I haven't related it to to the space actually. But now I do understand it yeah. uh, in this way. Yeah, they're 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 in an order like that. It's it's also mm -hmm. just. A perception you could say it's whether consciousness is actually infinite i'm not sure exactly what the reality of it is but it's a perception but when we say it's non-local local it's something like that 
uh, non-local, that's, I think, something a bit different. Yeah, it's a bit different, but it's related to that, right? Um, I don't think so. Not quite sure. Okay, thank you. Mila? Okay. Someone else had a question? Okay. I just want to say if um, if uh, this one is similar mm, process mm, when we are aware of um, being angry, so you get angry and then uh, you wake up and uh, you are aware of your anger. So this is the same when you notice all these other object. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, it's it's quite it's quite exactly that. Uh, the thing, the commentary will probably say that Sariputta actually has to come out of the jhana first before he can determine one them one by one. And this is a point of contention for a lot of people. They believe that the commentaries are making stuff up that isn't in line with the original teachings because they have this idea that when you're in the jhana, you can't. Um, take the jhana as an object, or you can't be aware or mindful or, or so on. It's To me, it's just splitting hairs. It's not really fair to the commentaries. The commentaries are just trying to explain technically what happens, because technically there will be moments where you're fixated on the experience. You're in the jhana, you might say. And then at any moment, you can, what the commentary says, come out of the jhana, but all that means is you you stop fixating on it, you stop cultivating it, and instead you become aware of the... I mean, it's quite reasonable, really, and practical that you change your your state of attention to focus on the jhana factors themselves because they're real. And so this is the moment after where you, as you say, wake up, and you. it's a shift of attention where you are instead looking at your state of mind, looking at the realities is the point. And this is really important, is that the, the, dis, the difference in that shift is really that, that at one moment you were in a conceptual frame of mind, you were focusing on, say, a casina or whatever, but let's say a casina, a color, and you have this, mm. this concept that you've created in your mind and your, your object of attention is this color, and you're not aware of impermanent suffering or non-self because your object is not impermanent suffering or non-self. It's... It's a concept. And then, then you start looking at the reality of it and, and the reality of the mind that's observing it. And you see that ah, reality is, is impermanent suffering and non-self. This is very clear. Thank you very much, Bante. So Bante, well, uh, during, let's say, this uh, jhana where there's infinite space, and can there be, what you just explained, um, alternating moments between... Um, comprehending what's happening but then again being into the state and it, does it happen quickly or is it like one flow of being into this jhana and then and then afterwards you you think about it and then you go no it can't be afterwards it has to be at the moment you, you notice what's happening the moment previous you're aware of what just happened i mean technically it's the moment previous but it feels like you're aware at the moment it's happening Oh, okay. So it's like a quick mind moment. Yeah, it's not common. I mean, this is this is something worth noting that most people who would practice these things would never have the uh, presence of mind to make that switch. You really need either the Buddha's wisdom himself or the instruction, because Sariputta and Moggallana, before they came to the Buddha, they were quite developed and I would think they had already practiced the jhanas to some extent. But you notice all they had to do was hear the Buddha's teaching and realize what what was the what was it that they were taught? Yang Kinchis no uh Ye Dhamma Hetu Babavai Ye Sang Dhamang Tatagatahu the Dhammas that arise with a cause, they're arising and they're ceasing. It was exactly this sort of thing of realizing that Reality is made up of moments of arising and ceasing. You wouldn't have, without the Buddha's wisdom, you wouldn't think to make that connection. You'd be just enamored with the 
kasina or the nothingness and just focused on cultivating nothingness, cultivating infinite space, thinking that that's the goal because you have no inkling of the path as being related to seeing arising and ceasing. Isn't that how wrong views can uh, come up? Like people who don't understand what they just experience make up new religions or something? Yeah, I mean, they don't come from that. They come from ignorance. They come from wrong view. But th these are uh, the sort of things that are used or are interpreted by one's ignorance, by one's uh, corruption of mind or distortion of mind to fit with one's narrative or to make up new narratives. Yeah, absolutely. But it doesn't come from practicing these things. It's not because they practice these things. But without wisdom, practicing these things often leads to formulating religions and views and that sort of thing. Thank you, Bante. Bante, as far as I can see in my practice, like it's, you cannot control when uh, there is an absorption or or anything. I mean, uh, so Sariputta was able to do that, that um, came out. Oh, oh yeah, that's, it's called mastery. You can read about it in the Visuddhimaga. Uh -huh. There's a whole detailed description. People yeah, have yeah. written books on it. Yeah. I, I remember three, ty three types of mastery, right? Like it's, uh, I don't know, Five, the first... Five. Wrong, but I think there's five types Three. of mastery. I've heard that the uh, Buddha himself, when he's uh, giving a sermon, in between every sentence he attends the uh, first jhana. Mm -hmm. Before he speaks the next sentence, he attends the first jhana. That quickly. Yeah, it's interesting. To me, it seems like uh, you have no control over it. <laughs> Well, that's why we why we do the we, we during the course you know there are, there's a part at the end where we um, instruct the meditator to cultivate mastery. Mm -hmm. That's what that is. I can't wait to learn some more when I come. <laughs> but it is said to be the highest form of uh, uh, happiness. The world is the world uh, we are short of attaining the path, the happiness even, of the jhanas. Yeah, I think I think even the jhanas are like so much, so much more, you know, higher than anything can the in the sensual world can give you. There are five kinds of mastery. There's the mastery in adverting, in attaining, in resolving, in emerging, in reviewing. Ooh. I never heard this enumeration. I thought something like um, master and expert, and I don't know the, is it intermediate? I don't know. Access, maybe. I haven't heard this three, uh, five, Bonte. Visuddhi Magga 23, 28, chapter 23, paragraph 20, sorry, 27. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And not, the, not just the jhanas, the mastery of the, uh, the magical powers of Binya. There's a story about a, a, a group of monks going on arms round and uh, one of their lay supporters. There was a kid, and he, yeah, the kid, there was an eagle trying to attack the kid. And uh, I think only one monk was able to prevent that with his magical powers because he could quickly attain the to that state. Other monks could. So after that, they also tried to uh, practice the, how to be able to attain it fast. For me, magical powers are so such an interesting topic. <laughs> I know I shouldn't focus on it, but... You can read about them in the Visuddhimagga. There's a whole section on... Yeah, 
I I guess I read even the Anguttara whenever wherever I could find something about it. So I'm not sure the Visuddhimagga I have. Maybe I haven't. You can accept but it. It's I, actually no, surprisingly simple and straightforward. Not mm -hmm. easy necessarily, but certainly doable. Yeah, that's Hard that's call. the interesting part to me that this is still mundane nothing mystical about it like it's not a miracle or something yeah. well, if you can attend the Bupenu Asanu Satinyana it will be very interesting I didn't understand what you said uh, Bupenu Asanu means the ability to oh, yeah. see your previous lives yeah. Bay in the past Niwasa. Niwasa is like dwelling, but it means uh, life, basically. Anusati. I think I have, I have heard a funny interpretation of some people who try to interpret this to match one life interpretation, like, just like previous oh, yeah. forms. It's unbelievable how they can, because you read the Buddha talking about here I was born like this, and I had that this was my name, and this was my clan. How do you interpret that as being one life? <laughs> Why would you even try? It's so stubborn. I just uh, I just saw a movie where uh, the I mean the whole story was about people who could remember every single life they had. So it's very interesting. I think angels get it for like a seven life uh, limit by birth to be able to see back to seven lives, if I remember right. Again, Bhikkhus, by completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness, aware that there is nothing, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the base of nothingness. And the states in the base of nothingness, the perception of the base of nothingness, and the unification of mind, the contact, feeling, perception, volition, and mind, the zeal, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention, these states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him, those states arose. Known they were present. Known they disappeared. He understood thus, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. Again, because by completely surmounting the base of nothingness, Riputta entered upon and abided in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. He, he emerged mindful from that attainment. Having done so, he contemplated the states that have passed, ceased, and changed thus. So in this, these states, not having been, come into being. Having been, they vanish. Regarding these states, he abided un attracted, unrepelled, independent, detached, free, dissociated, with a mind rid of barriers. He understood. There is an escape beyond. And with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. Again, because by completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the cessation of perception and feeling and his stains were destroyed by his seeing with wisdom. He emerged mindful from that attainment. Having done so, he recalled the states that had pa passed, ceased, and changed thus. So indeed, these states, not having been, come into being. Having been, they vanish. Regarding those states, he abided unattracted, unrepelled, independent, detached, free, dissociated with a mind rid of barriers. He understood there is no escape beyond, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is not. 
The difference here is he has to recall the states that had passed. Because in the attainment of cessation, of course, there is no arising. And this kind of glosses over the fact that there is a difference here. This is a, a different sort of attainment. The Buddha would put them in, in this grouping, the nine attainments, but the ninth one is well, the attainment of Nibbana. And it is made to sound like just the next step. And practically it kind of is, but Technically, it's in a different category because it's based on wisdom. Based, It's attained not by taking something as an object and focusing on it, but by seeing the Four Noble Truths and letting go. Because, rightly speaking, were it to be said of anyone, he has attained mastery and perfection in noble virtue, attained mastery and perfection in noble con concentration, attain mastery and perfection in noble wisdom, attain mastery and perfection in noble deliverance. Is It is of Sariputta indeed that rightly speaking this should be said. Because, rightly speaking, were it to be said of anyone, he is the son of the Blessed One, born of his breast, born of his mouth, born of the Dhamma, created by the Dhamma, and heir in the Dhamma, not an heir in material things. It is of Sariputta indeed that, rightly speaking, this should be said. Bhikkhus, the matchless wheel of the Dhamma set rolling by the Tathagata is kept rolling rightly by Sariputta. That is what the Blessed One said. The Bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Sadhu, 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 sadhu. Such a high praise. Oh my goodness. That's why he's uh, the Dhamma Senadipati. I wonder what, what it means, born of his breast. Uh, I think it's actually a reference to the way Brahmins talk about being born of Brahma. So, Bhante, uh, so uh, Mahasayado explained that. Uh, you can have the same experiences of the four jhanas during in insight stages, different stages of insight. And is it possible to have uh, experiences of the remaining four jhanas during vipassana practice? The immaterial jhanas, you mean? Yes. So he's just trying to describe how the qualities are the same the immaterial, he's not actually saying that you attain, well, he kind of is, but he's kind of pointing out that the word jhana is not quite as cut and dried as people like to, not quite as simple as it often is presented. But when we talk about the eight attainments, those are samatha jhanas. Those are not what Mahasi Sayadaw was talking about. So the, the immaterial jhanas are actually in some sense, I think, still considered the fourth jhana. They're kind of like a part of the fourth jhana. I mean, it's not quite fair, but they kind of are. Yeah. You yes. say they're based on the fourth jhana, and you could argue that they're still fourth jhana, kind of. They're not, but um, it's really just the object that changes. So, but, but that, so that's a summit to... Uh, uh, version of the four jhanas, you could say, or the four, the four stages of jhana. If you want to understand what they're referring to, because four jhanas is kind of can be misunderstood as being entities or things, but they're just talking about criteria. If it has, if it fits these criteria, it's it's this jhana. It's it's given this name. It's called the first. It's called the second when it becomes when when the, the qualities of it are the, are thus. But remember, we're just ta talking about qualities of mind, right? Mm -hmm. The immaterial attainments are referring to something else. There's something specific in terms of uh, well, some of the attainment. So it's probably because of the object. You, there you yes. take a different okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're they're remarkable because the object is immaterial. The object is not a physical object. Okay. 
not a sensual object, not seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, or feeling. It's a mental object. So it's simpler. There's a simpler mental process involved. So it's more refined. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it has the very same ingredients as the, as Bhante mentioned, the fine material jhanas. So there is basically with, with the ingredients only or the factors or just four types. Right. So when we focus, when we do samatha on, let's say, an imagined disc or an imagined color, a color isn't a material object, but it's a material characteristic. So it's still considered immaterial. No, the color is material. That's still material. Only when you abandon that are you into the immaterial state. It's it's called derived matter when when you see the color of of something. Still matter. So what I want to ask about the immaterial attainments are they characterized by equanimity or is there piti and sukha present like in the first jhanas? They're based on the fourth jhana. No piti or sukha. Thank you. Uh, in this sutta, um, uh, it seems that uh, with the fading away of uh, of uh, the first jhana, for example, then there was uh, the abiding on the following one. So it gives the idea that uh, uh, it was wine behind another one. So uh, this process happened quickly in the case of Sariputta. Uh, well, it took him two weeks, actually. Mm. But we don't know much more than that. Mm. So, so my question, because um, I was thinking like, uh, so it's possible that you cultivate one jhana and then uh, after some time you can cultivate another one. Right. Mm. But uh, in, in the case of our practice, uh, we, we is not necessary that we go through this one, right? Right. It's not none of it. None of it's necessary. That this is more like Sariputta being able to uh, confirm that it doesn't matter how high your attainment goes. Um, it's it's still behind. It's made up of Im impermanent states that are arising and ceasing. So the use, what, what, I, I sort of an, a useful thing, a reason for going through the jhanas, not useful for most practitioners, but for someone like Sariputta at least, a useful thing of going through them all is the certainty, the ability to verify that um, the 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 whole of the the universe basically is made up of these things, that there is no state you can get to. I mean, pointing out um, neither perception, or the state of neither perception nor non-perception is, is powerful because there's not really any potential for describing something more refined or higher than that. And that's why the, the final attainment is something very different, because it doesn't just, it isn't just a refinement of the last one, it's a uh, letting go of it all. And then after that, we have Nibbana, which is not possible to describe at all. Well, it's possible to describe. It's not like it's mysterious. It's just... Well, but to understand it is difficult. Um, maybe. Just difficult, maybe. <laughs> not really. I mean, I guess it's it's kind of the sort of thing you can't... Maybe it's not fair to say you can describe it. Yeah, it's not really fair to say you can describe it, but it, it's uh, I mean, you can kind of explain it. You can you can give an analogy, but you can't give an example because that's something unique that you have. Well, you couldn't you couldn't describe it in terms of saying 
this is how it feels or that's how it feels. I mean, that's by its very nature, that's not possible. Yes. But uh, there's, um, I mean, other, that's, it shouldn't be trivialized either because it's um, the, the experience of it is, uh, is infinitely refreshing and uh, pacifying and just a, a, a pacifying, creating a sense of peace that is beyond anything. There, there are some like analogies given. Oh. Like, imagine if you have been carrying a huge weight your entire life and suddenly you drop it and the yeah. relief you feel. Or, or, or if you are like a cancer patient who has been suffering your entire life and uh, in court cured from some method and you feel the freedom. Something like Melinda that. Panna has a whole section on trying to uh, compa give comparisons or give analogies related to Nibbana. It's quite worth reading. Some good uh -huh. similes. I think about like a lotus pool, if you're uh, starving and heat, you have heat stroke walking through the desert and suddenly you come upon a pool of water and you plunge into the water, that sort of thing. <laughs> What's the name of the text? The Melinda Panha, Questions of King Melinda. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Bhante. There's, there's an abridged translation by Bhikkhu Pesala that has that in it, I think. There's also a longer translation by Rice Davids that's older and, well, better in some ways, maybe not as good in some ways. Isn't that the one that we read? Uh, the older version, I remember, if I remember. Did we read the whole thing? Yes. I, th I, I we think did. What's, we, we started reading the abridged version and then realized that that we were missing some important parts and we switched, right? I think so, yeah. Like if I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember doing that, yes. But uh, is it fair to say that we can, I mean, we can cultivate the jhanas to me it's like it's more like uh focusing on purity of the mind that's or just being efficient in mindfulness i don't know how can uh, one cultivate the negatives you mean it you mean through our practice cultivate the jhanas what do you mean of course you can cultivate yeah. in those ways uh, well, Mahasi Sayada describes how you could you could interpret what we do as being jhana. He gives an explanation of how it's like the jhanas, like the idea of Sankarupekanyana being the fourth jhana. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember reading that, yes. But the, it's, it it's sort of this... Quality. this yeah, except it, it doesn't and it isn't supposed to in the sense that you, the, the technical explanation is you can't actually give rise to seeing clearly vipassana when you're in the jhana. And that's why they talk about coming out of the, the jhana. And it's created this controversy when it really shouldn't because it's just technical. It's just momentary. One moment you're quote unquote in the jhana and the next moment you're out of the jhana, which means you're taking ultimate reality as an object. You've just switched your perspective. Um, so you, with Sankarupekanyan, you couldn't say that you shouldn't say that it's in the jhana technically, because that would mean technically you're focused on a, a concept or something. But uh, the qualities are enough in the same way that once you've emerged from the ja from a samatha jhana your qualities of mind are still enough to to provide the the basis to focus on experience without the hindrances is the point yeah so it's it, rather so, than saying it's like being in the jhana it's like that moment of coming out of the jhana sankara pekanyana is like that moment of coming out of the jhana yeah, it's pure mm -hmm. in that way. 
So yeah, experientially, I only can see that, I mean, whenever the hindrances are not there, like any any type of jhana or whatever can happen and it's out of my control completely. But the right after moment, then you can be mindful of that. Well, even in Vipassana, you can attain Palasamapati, which is comparable to the jhanas. Well, it's not comparable. Palasamapati is a jhana. It's no kutra jhana. Yeah. Yes, it is. So maybe that's what it is. Okay. If the um, cessation of perception, feeling, and um, thinking is the absence of consciousness, then how is it different from deep sleep? Well, the most important difference is the the cause. The result isn't the most important thing, but it's the cause, which is the letting go. Deep sleep isn't caused by letting go of... It, well, it isn't caused by wisdom of seeing reality is not worth clinging to. But it's that experience and the letting go that's, um, well, maybe not even the most important, but it's what makes it distinct and what makes the result distinct because deep sleep is still not cessation. It doesn't have the peacefulness. It doesn't change your life. It isn't life-changing to fall asleep. Is it, is it possible to like be in a deep sleep with sitting up and your head is upright and... Yeah, it's it only it only appears similar to deep sleep because we're not Sariputta to be able to tell the difference. But is it possible to fall asleep like that? I thought I thought when uh, the I mean when you fall asleep, it's like just you just collapse. Yeah, especially that's deep notice, sleep. That's a notable difference. Deep sleep is just Bhavanga Jitta. There's nothing awesome about this vipaka. No, I mean, I mean, some people think, you know, that you're meditating and maybe you just fall, fell asleep. But if if the body doesn't collapse or your head doesn't, you know, collapse and anything like that, then I I don't see how that can be sleep called sleep. I've seen people like standing in the bus and sleeping. <laughs> it doesn't happen. <laughs> that's not that's not completely sleeping. They are just well, people do sleepwalk, so that's maybe not quite uh, sufficient. Uh huh. But it is. But no, no. I, I would. I have to affirm what you said because that is one of the ways when testing. Uh, when you test someone who's entered into the cessation, you can actually lift their arms up and their arms will stay spread out or you can uh, pick them up and their body is rigid and that sort of thing. To be honest, I'm not, that, that isn't, uh, I, I've witnessed this and I'm not 100% convinced because it's also quite possible that the person has entered into a samatha jhana. We had a bhikkhu, uh, a mechi, a, a woman who was eight precepts in Thailand who was touted as this incredible meditator and she was paraded out and she could enter into cessation at will but I watched her kill a mosquito right in front of me there was a mosquito on her leg and she just reached down and squashed it without a thought and kept talking to me and I thought how the heck could this be real and later on she was just vicious because people were jealous of her and were saying bad things about her, and she just retorted with such horrible, insulting, vicious words that I thought, how could this be? She ended up being excommunicated from our monastery. Uh, so, yeah. Ante, can these things still be related to habits, even if you, like, like reflex if you kill a being, even though you you are in possibly. I, I'm not convinced though. Like the way she did it seemed pretty. I don't know. And then just how she became vicious and mean, and and she yelled at me once. I got in trouble. It was my fault, but 
she kept bringing medicine to Ajahn Tong, and of course Ajahn Tong would drink it. And so the monk who looked after Ajahn Tong was getting very upset about it. And he said to me once, he said, and because she was yelling at him, she would get very mad at him. And so he said to me, don't let Ajahn Tong drink whatever she brings. If she brings it, just bring it to the back and dump it out or something like that. I don't know if he said dump it out. So I was just following orders. He left because he didn't want to be there. She came in, gave, brought the medicine, and immediately I picked it up and brought it to the back. And oh, she tore into me. She got so, and, and so she used very, she said I, something like, you should, I hope you get sick and die or something. <laughs> and like, wow. and that Jen Tong turned to me and he gave me this, this, this disappointed look or something. And then he, she, she said, he said, what happened? And she said, he threw it, he threw out the medicine. He threw out medicine. What a terrible thing to do or something. And I and uh, Jean Tong looked at me and said, "I didn't." Or a neck, a neck, uh, he, sorry, his driver, this lay person was there as well, and he was trying to figure out what had happened. And I said, "I didn't throw it out. It's in the back." And so a neck, this man brought it back out and gave it to Jean Tong, and he drank it. It's like I was just following orders. I didn't know what I was doing, but she was pretty vicious, and and she was supposed to have been. You know, enlightened, but I'm skeptical. But, yeah, I mean, even the jhanas. Uh, I mean, is is the are they possible for such a person? Oh yeah, I mean, Devadatta attained them, and it wasn't until he did something really terrible that he lost them. Uh huh. What What but, was the terrible thing? When he, did he lose? Uh, I took. The schism, I think, maybe I can't remember. Schism and uh -huh, tried to okay. kill the Buddha, or he tried to kill the Buddha. Was that the first thing? He did a lot of bad things. But yeah, the jhanas can be. I mean, that's what it started to seem like. She would just had very, a very strong mind, and you can force yourself into the jhanas through habit, through through cult, prior cultivation. It's only if you mm -hmm. really become corrupt in mind and try to do terrible things that you'll lose the ability and it just becomes too much. Your mind is no longer strong enough. But I think that's all she was doing. Yeah, and the thing with uh, jhanas is that if you lose them, uh, it's, it'll be no good to you at the time of death. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, you will not be born in Brahmarilim if you lose, uh, lose your jhanas, unlike uh, attaining enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Well, for a Sotapan, yeah, it is good. yeah. For a Sotapan, it is possible to badmouth uh, other people, but I don't think can kill mosquitoes. Break the precept. No, that doesn't seem right. But it, also, the badmouth thing a Sotapan would do would never be like this. There's, it's not just, it's not a binary thing. A Sotapan has lost a lot of, um, a lot of anger and greed. Or potential for anger and greed because of the the loss of wrong view. So Sotapanna would not. The way she was acting was. Uh, I mean, it's certainly technically probably possible, but I I, I don't think she was a Sotapanna. I mean, what, hey, I was, what, what do I know? From my side, I was that you and Arahans can and use harsh or a speech that can be hurtful to others, but that's also just related to their habits. They have no intention but, to hurt the person. Yeah, and they don't They don't appear angry. She was very angry and mm. uh, upset and quite quite, quite nasty, actually. But sure, could have sold upon it potentially. She could have been a Sotapanna. That's it's not fair to say to write her off completely. Something we don't realize is we don't give people we don't give each other enough credit and we're quick to denounce people and focus on their bad qualities. And she certainly had good qualities. She was good at um letting go. Like after she'd have this bout of anger, she was quite quick to move on. She had a very strong mind and she had very good qualities of mind and that's worth worth appreciating. That's the sort of thing a Gentong would do. Focus on people's good qualities. But did she apologize ever, Bhante? 
<laughs> I don't think so. No, there was a whole, she was, she was made, it, it became a whole thing where they, the monks made a formal determination because they were trying to figure out what were they allowed to do. And the monks made this formal declaration and broadcast it where they would refuse to receive food from her. That's what monks can do. It's called overturning the bowl. So you refuse to receive food from such a person. And so the Sangha was no longer, I, I don't know if this is how it, I think this, I'm not sure. This might be how it actually goes. But what they decided was no monk was allowed to receive food from her. And she, I think she was told she would have to apologize. I think eventually she was made to disrobe. It happened to a couple of nuns. There was another nun who was forcibly disrobed, I think. I don't know that the other nun actually deserved it. There was, I mean, this isn't all one-sided. The, the monks on their side were not pure either. Going back, back to deep sleep, I don't know if there's any uh, anything in the text which supports this, but um, I had this experience during sleeping where I had a lucid dream and I could note my movements where, when once I recognized that I'm um, sleeping, dreaming. So I noted my movements. I don't know for how long, but so this should mean that it's possible to be mindful during sleep or not. Because clearly okay. for me, it was like. Well, it's, I don't know if you could even call that sleep at that point. There's something called sleep paralysis, where the body, you can't move the body, but the mind is awake. And I mean, not that that's what you were experiencing, but. The point is that there are many different states related to body and mind. So your brain might have been in a specific state, but that's physical, right? When the mind is alert, I don't think you could say that that is sleep. Dreams, perhaps, you could even say technically are not sleep anymore. Though there's issues because, of course, the brain is in a specific state. Uh, that um, means the minds that arise are somewhat uh, unconstrained and so it's hard to control in an ordinary dream you aren't, you aren't lucid in the sense that you can direct or discern manage the, the, the or order the, the experiences so dreams are often chaotic so with lucid dreams uh, there is that state of mind so the brain must be in a different sort of state so there is the allowance of mindfulness I mean, that's a very efficient way of using sleeping this time of sleeping it was possible all the time well a much more efficient way is to sleep less and not dream <laughs> yes yes Let beings dream less and less you'd say an arahant doesn't dream i don't think not not ordinary dreams there is this theory that dreams are caused by unfulfilled desires. And if an arahant doesn't have desires, and then it would make sense that he would not dream. Well, there are many causes of dreams. They say indigestion can cause dreams. But I guess it's you'd have to say that it might not be the only cause. You still need some kind of distracted mind, perhaps. And also I heard that uh, while sleeping, like if your heart rate drops or some problem occurs in the body, your brain sends a signal or shows you some scary dream to wake you up, something like that. What, what is this practice of lucid dreaming, like actively someone in the middle of the day not needing sleep? Uh, yeah, etc. I don't know what 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 is the purpose uh, or the process? Cutting off the central nervous system, so you are not bothered by your senses, but only you are active in the mind. Can you remember a past life in a dream? Maybe, Maybe. it's possible. It's much more probably accurate to say you have experiences that 
could be related to experiences you or could be um, conditioned by experiences you had in past lives. So that may come in the form of a vision that is similar to a vision you had in a past life or more commonly that is conditioned by a vision that you had in a past life. So this is a good explanation, uh, a complex explanation of why you sometimes experience things in dreams that have no relationship to your present life. Of course, there can be other reasons as well, but one of them can be that it is partially conditioned by past life memories, past life experiences, and partially conditioned by um, the mental capacity to form new connections and extrapolate. In other words, imagine and create fantasies and imaginations. Thank you, Bhante. Also, you can dream something that might happen in the future as well. Met several people who has had similar experiences. They have seen what is going to happen in a dream. I have that Hello, many times. Bhante, another question. Is it possible for one person to become enlightened without hearing the Buddha's teaching? Yes, possible. It's not easy, of course, but that person is called a Pacheka Buddha. Okay. It's very rare. Where are they? I mean, are they born before the Buddha or after? Yeah, there's kind of um, an idea that they will all disappear before the Buddha arises. I'm not sure if that's totally valid, but that's the doctrine, I think. And they won't come, there won't be such people anymore until after the Buddha Sasana disappears, maybe. Isn't the f uh, first ever Buddha um, a Pracheka Buddha? Well, we don't have a sense that there's a sense of a first ever anything. But it's but but okay. But sorry, um, that doesn't matter because no, a, a, a Buddha is um, different from a Pacheka Buddha. Some Asam Buddha is different from a Pacheka Buddha in that they um, not only do they discover it for themselves, but they're able to teach it to others. They're able to understand it. So a Pacheka Buddha, the word Pacheka means private or personal or or uh, self related to the self, specifically self, in the sense that they aren't capable of teaching others. They don't have a deep understanding of what they attained. They could describe it, but they couldn't uh, explain it as a teaching to others. They couldn't teach the things that the Buddha taught. And every Buddha is like that. So it's it's not a matter of being the first, because it has no relation to the the pre a previous Buddha that has a relationship to your cult, your own cultivation, the level of cultivation. But there had to be a first Buddha on this planet, no? Because the planet at the beginning. Yeah. But within this kalpa, there have been already four Buddhas, and uh, Maitre, Buddha Maitri is yet to come. Uh, he will be the last Buddha before the end of the world. And after uh, Buddha Maitri, there will be an extremely long period without any Buddha whatsoever. During those times, maybe there will be Pacheka Buddhas. And actually, we are in a fortunate cup. I once read that it's very rare that so many Buddhas arise in, during one world cycle or I'm not sure if I understand Kappa correctly, but... Yeah, it's, a, it's called a Badra Kalpa, like five Buddhas in this Kalpa. It's mm -hmm. a very rare. Badra Kalpa. How long is the Kalpa? How many really years? long time. <laughs> Sorry? Well, if you, if you uh, imagine the 
Mount, imagine Mount Everest, and if you take a cloth of silk and wipe the top of the mountain every hundred years one time, a time will come the Mount Everest will no longer be there because of uh, the particles being removed every time you wipe. Even even when that happens, the kalpa will still have time to go. So that's an analogy given how long it is. Wow. Um, I have an unrelated question. Maybe somebody asked it before. I don't know, but some people translate vinyana as consciousness. And other people translate it as sense consciousness, which is the correct translation. There are six types of vinyana. There's chakku vinyana, sota vinyana, gana vinyana. Chakku vinyana means eye consciousness. Sota vinyana, ear consciousness. Gana vinyana, nose consciousness. And uh, then there's uh, the mind that can be conscious of th other thoughts. So the translation sense consciousness is correct? Consciousness is correct. I mean, sense consciousness is just not something separate. It's just that uh, classification. Mm, thank you. Why is it uh, uh, that rare to um, for to Buddha uh, for for or five Buddhas to exist in one kalpa? What's the question? Why is it required? No, it's not required. No, what, certain... why is it rare? What, why? Because it's uh, extremely hard to become a Buddha. So you would imagine it's a very rare incident, even if uh, one Buddha appears in one Kalpa. Kappa? Like yeah, you have to cultivate. Word. Yeah, Kappa. So. so yeah, go ahead. I, I was just going to say that there are lots of u universal cycles where there is no Buddha, actually. That's more common or to in, in a cycle to have just one. That's more common. So it's very, very rare to have five. That's what it means. And this is because uh the I don't know the quality of mind of the people that live in in this period is so low that the sasana ends really quickly i think I think what Sanka was saying, like the Buddha not ready yet or, or the Bodhisatta is not there yet it's more i think more related to that. But isn't what what the five, do you think? five Buddhas? Five Buddhas did not appear at once. I think she's thinking uh, five Buddhas appeared in this kalpa at the same time. No, they no, no. appeared like so. When the previous Buddha appeared, uh, things would have been different. So we can't really compare. Like the lifespan is very long. The Kasapa, the previous Buddha. What I know is that one Buddha appears when there is no teaching left, so nobody remembers any teaching. Isn't that right? Yeah, when, when there is no long, no longer. Uh, when, whenever the Buddha appears, the, the Dhamma is hidden to the world. But that only it, refers to the human world, right? Yeah, probably. But it, is the reverse true as well? When there is no Dharma remembered, a Buddha will appear? No, no. I mean, uh, Buddhas will not appear even if there's no Dharma. Uh, the, the normal way is there will be no Buddhas even for a long time. So... Even if there is no Dhamma in the world, you can't expect a Buddha to appear, uh, a fully enlightened Buddha to appear. That's a rare occurrence. 
But whenever the Buddha appears, he discovers uh, the Dhamma or he preaches the Dhamma to the world. And is there any reason known why it happened that there were or there are going to be five Buddhas in this time period? Possibly because uh, they cultivated uh, uh, paramis or uh, paramitas uh, during the same time period. For example, there are stories of uh, Bodhisattva Maitreya meeting with uh, our Buddha, our Bodhisattva, during while cultivating paramitas in the past. But uh, our Buddha was just a little bit ahead in terms of cultivation, so uh, he became the Buddha first. And also there, there are like different uh, types of uh, Buddhas based on how they, what, what is, uh, what uh, quality is more prominent during their, uh, during the time they were cultivating Paramitas. Like, uh, there's a, our Buddha is called a Panyadika Buddha, means one whose wisdom is more prominent. Uh, I think Buddha Maitre is Viryadika uh, or Shaddadika, I can't remember which one it is. Viryadika is Virya. Virya, yes. Viryadika yes. is one who is uh, like, uh, has a lot of effort or energy. The other one is Adhatika, means uh, one who has a lot of faith. I think for the energy, uh, they for them it takes longer for the than compared to a Panya uh, one. Yeah, yeah. Like sixteen, sixteen Asanke Kalpas. Like sixteen. It asanke. takes longer for them. And I think it's four for the uh, wisdom. Yep. So even though they all perfected the ten paramis, they still have different qualities. And so that means there's one more stage, or I don't know how to say it exactly. But during the during the time of cultivating the paramitas, they are different. But after becoming Buddha, they are same in wisdom, same in uh, everything, all the mental qualities. But there are differences like uh, their lifespan, their parents, and uh, their radiance. There are something like some things uh, in which they differ. Okay, thank you. And the lover said about Buddhas appearing in the uh, human realm are they appearing in other realms as well no they only appear in, in on earth i mean up here they become enlightened on, on earth it was referred to the dhamma if the dhamma disappears uh, completely from samsara and it's not mm -hmm. true in the other realms other beings will see still remember and know the time. Okay, thank you. This is so counterintuitive because you would think that beings in higher realms would have more wisdom, would reach enlightenment easier than humans. Not necessarily. I mean, uh, uh, think of it as like uh, rich people. Do they have necessarily have higher wisdom than? Uh, Middle class people, in the same way, people, uh, beings who are living a more pleasant life uh, are not necessarily wise. Yeah, it's, it's, a good, yeah. Uh, it's a good reminder of the difference between Lokya Kusala and uh, Lokutra Kusala, but Kusala of the past. Someone can be a very kind and generous and pure individual but still be on the wrong path and never be free, come free from suffering. Also, um, the population of the heavens are 
pretty um so it's not it's not a high number of devas or brahmas especially very rare few isn't it isn't like that Bante? never really thought of population of heaven and population of the brahma realms we just hear often in the commentaries about so many hundreds of thousands of devas becoming enlightened listening to the mm -hmm. buddhist teaching but I guess there's billions of humans, so maybe the Deva realms aren't quite as many. I remember a, a talk from you, Bhante. I think it's uh, from the Anguttara. The title is Few. So, and then it's described how how few are the beings who are who live in the sea or things like that, and it's um. And it keeps shortening and shortening. That's one. That is the one that uh, does that. Like well, it's the humans probably are. the fewer are born in heaven, but given that the lifespan yeah. is so much longer, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's fewer of them. I mean, and I also, guess it, of course, it fluctuates. Mm -hmm. At one point, we'll all be. We're born in the higher heavens. Also, one disadvantage in heavens is that it's hard to make uh, people understand impermanent suffering so, because it's very pleasant and much stable than human. Yeah, maybe. I heard, I heard that um, human beings um, have a good balance in terms of. Um, uh, painful and pleasant feeling for practice meditation. So it was good to, in terms of of uh, practicing. That's true. I mean, some people think that if you suffer more, then it's more likely that you would let go or do more meditation. So it makes sense that the human realm there would be. Yeah, it's about a balance. Like if you suffer, if the suffering is too great, still uh, it's not good for uh, spiritual development. Otherwise, hell being should attain enlightenment faster than any of us. Well, except for with hell beings, it's more the reason that put them there than the suffering itself. Aren't there, are there monks in the Deva realms, or is it? You can't ordain in the Deva realms. There was even Saka, I was just reading yesterday, I think even Saka can't ordain. Why? It's not human. Huh. Wasn't that because of the Naga, which turned himself into a human? Then It wasn't because of the Naga, but that was the first example of it. Mm. That's yeah. You could say that's why the rule was was spoken, but it was just confirmed when the Naga tried. They said, "No, you're not a monk." I was curious about something. Um, we have talked about uh, if a deva get angry, so then uh, he reborn quickly under uh, lower realms. This is can be also true for the uh, the contra. Like if somebody is in hell and they have a, like a moment of mindfulness, he can come out of it. Mm, maybe there. Are, I mean, there are states. I don't know about in hell. The, the answer may be no. Um, it's maybe a little more technical than that. But there is um, with with betas with ghosts, hungry ghosts or betas. They can yeah. become devas quite quickly. So okay. this is a big deal. This is a big deal in Buddhist communities where we uh, do good deeds for our for the deceased relatives. In case part of the reason is because in case they became ghosts, we can they can quickly benefit from us doing good deeds. Vedas and devas are uh, to some extent interchangeable or. or Closely related, 
It's like you could say a peta is like a deva without any punya, without any goodness. But they still have the mm. etherealness about them. Those are the asuras, right, Bhante? Asuras yeah, are the ones. Asuras, you don't, you don't hear as much about them. But there's, a, there's stories in the Beta Vatu. Uh, I think there's at least, I think it's the Beta Vatu where um, with with the someone doing merit on their behalf and them, them appreciating it, they were able to immediately go to heaven. Yeah. Their their lifespan is absolutely undetermined, so it's not. I mean, they can come out of it any time. I was saying there's a story of the uh, the frog or the toad that uh, who was listening to the dharma, and he got killed by one of the lay people, and uh, was born in heaven because of that. Right, but the lifespan didn't end because of listening to the Dhamma. Though there is something to that where something very good can also bring about the can can trigger the the premature uh, ripening of bad karma. So it's quite possible that the do- the frog was killed because of the wholesomeness arising in the mind. But I mean that it's not a bad thing. It just means there's a clearing up, or there's some kind of uh, some kind of triggering, and as a result, the the frog was killed and born in heaven. Manduka, Manduka Teva Buddha. The gentle yeah. talks about that one. It's uh, it's similar with the enlightened beings, right? Too, like it's uh, um. If, if we think of Angulimala mm-hmm. and Mogalana. Yeah, karma inter, uh, interacts with other karma. Or, no, it's fair to say, it's, it's, again, it's not karma, but the, the karmic repercussions of acts, the, the repercussions of mm-hmm. karma that was done in the past can uh, interfere with each other in strange ways. Yeah. So many, many of the ka- karmic force, or uh, how do you put it, uh, becomes defunct, but some cannot become defunct. Mm-hmm. Some is actually sped up. So it is common. It is the kind of thing you hear about where meditators will have strange accidents as a result of yeah. their mm-hmm. progress. Strange things happen. Maybe we shouldn't say that because that would discourage. It's scary, people. doesn't it? <laughs> well, the karma is there, and if you don't experience it now, it's going to be in the future. It's far better that you're prepared for it and you're in a good frame of mind to deal with it. I mean, most mostly, it's a, it's the same as when you have to experience uh, traumatic memories or that sort of thing. Like you'll you remember a lot of things you thought you'd forgotten about, and it's cleansing mm-hmm. during meditation. So I think it's along the same lines. It's part of the cleansing and better off experiencing. Now, I mean, it, it, that's sort of just anecdotal, but it seems to be occasionally a thing where strange things happen to you that you'll have to deal with. But they were going to cause bigger problems if in the future otherwise. It's like it's like if you have taken loans from many loan sharks and... Uh... They suddenly get to know that you are migrating out of the country. <laughs> and they right. come out there. Well, in the in the sutta, this happens quite a lot, right? But when uh, when the weaver's daughter is killed by his own father <laughs> because she became enlightened that day, and then and the other one when Sari, I, I guess he accompanies uh, Sariputta. Oh yeah. Um, the executioner. The executioner. Also, uh, I don't Bahia, know. maybe we could yes. throw in there. He was gorged to death. Mm, it's interesting that you would expect that people who meditate 
um, would have a similar view of the world. But it's like I've met people who meditated for 40 years and think the world is, they say the world is perfect and that there's nothing wrong in the world. And it's so strange that even people who've meditated for so long can see the world in and see reality in such different ways. Well, there's one way of describing the world as being perfect. I mean, it is. there isn't anything in one sense wrong with the world uh, in terms of the physicality of it. It's not the experiences, it's our, our mind's uh, perceptions of them, the clinging to them, that's the problem. It's only one way of describing it, because in another way you could say, well, it's just, it is inherently broken, inherently un... Unfixable. Inherently, inherently problematic, I suppose you could even say. But it's only problematic in terms of uh, our attachment to it. Well, depends how you describe it. It's not terrible in the sense to say that the world is perfect, because there is some wisdom behind saying the problem isn't the experiences. It's the fact that we don't see them for what they are, because if we saw them for what they are, we would, we would not suffer from them. Depends on the context as well. For example, the, in the Rathapala Sutta, you hear the world is insufficient, insatiable, and slave to craving. So that that's a different interpretation. That's Sutta Loka that he's talking about. But yeah, the the big a big problem with saying the world is perfect is the sense that it leads to that. Um, it's okay, or or it's right to be living in the world, but there is a wrongness to it. The, uh, uh, the only reason for being reborn in the world is the attachment, and freedom from attachment means to leads to freedom from the world. So, should we? Now, it's another question related with to what you said. When you get reborn, it's like a blind force that pulls you to another life or is it more like a conscious de decision it's more like a conscious decision so you have an intuition do you have an intuition of the um, thing i mean do you foresee the things that are in the world and that you could crave for or it's like very blindly you have the feeling that there's something there you want and that's why you go there. It's different for different people. You have Kama Nimitta, Gati Nimitta, uh, Kama Nimitta, Kama... What are the three? Kama Nimitta... Kama Gati. And Kama Nimitta and Gati Nimitta. What are they? The, the karma itself, the action itself, karma limited, the something involved in the action, like a what to uh, yeah. no, no, what is it? yeah, like like karma what to up, maybe is that what it's called? Uh, karma limited, yes, uh, like if you offer flowers, okay. you will see uh, flower, yeah, flower. what's the term? Uh, the term is karma limited, karma what to, I think, is the third one, karma, no. What to? Uh, hmm. What to is the object. I mean, what to uh -huh. means thing, basically. Kama nimitta. What to nimitta? I can't. I should know this. It's in. Find it somewhere. I don't think it's nimitta. It's kama nimitta. <laughs> One one is just a simple. I think it might be just nimitta. Uh, maybe one of them is just kamma, kamma, right? Kamma, then kamma nimitta, then gati nimitta. That's what. Mm -hmm. they are. Yes. 
Yes, Kamma yes. is the action. Kamma nimitta is the sign of the action, so a symbol of it. And gati nimitta is a vision of the something related to the the destination. So some people apparently have entire dreams about their future life. They can even imagine themselves traveling to the home of the people that they're going to be reborn with. Do, do you think it's conscious even for, uh, let's say, humans, conscious, conscious choice? Well, technically it is a conscious choice. It's a karma, right? Yes. But it's not very conscious in most people. It's pretty knee-jerk, instinctual, not, not controllable, yes. but it's uh -huh. still, you could still call it a choice, I think. Uh -huh. So if, if you, let's say, cultivated your mind and the mind is very strong, mm -hmm. we would be able to choose? I mean, um, we are able to not choose yeah, our last sort of, thoughts. Sort of. Sort of. Yeah, I have heard, I have heard if you if you cultivate the mind like cultivate the jhanas and the itipadas can pick your destination. Yeah, I don't uh -huh. know. If pick and choose yes. is quite the right word, but sort of. You're you're more discriminatory, but you're still going to be ruled by craving. You're just going to be able to. You're not going to be drawn to uh, certain types of craving. Isn't that somehow uh, connected with the uh, inclination and uh, um, how how much you develop some inclination in one sense or another? Yeah, I think there's actually a text where it says that it's because of sila. A person who has sila will be able to choose their rebirth, or will be able to have control over determining their rebirth. It's not technically control, but sila is an important part of the capacity to perceive the difference between good destinations and bad destinations, good inclinations and bad ones. Pante, if someone has mast mastered the making a resolve to a very high degree, can they make a resolve um, and to to be reborn as let's say a monk in their future right, life. That's, that's what it's actually referring to is if you have sila you can make those determinations you can make a, a, a determine determine in your in your mind to uh, a vow to be born here or born there there's a story of a a man and a woman who vowed to be reborn husband and wife in the future lives and the Buddha said it's because of sila. They're able to do that. Something like that. Just the power of the last thoughts, right? That's, uh, to me, it says, says that you have some, let's call it control. Well, having made the determination throughout your life is going to help. This is why Buddhists often make this determination may May I be uh, born wherever I am born. May it be in uh, in close to the Buddha Sasana. People make resolves to be reborn in the time of Siyariya Meteya, the next Buddha. If I am still not enlightened, may I be reborn in the time of Siyariya Meteya. Uh, uh, Ajahn Jodo. Uh, would lead people through this determination, a really long determination, I think. If I if I can become enlightened in this life, may I become enlightened in this life? If not, may I become enlightened? May I go to heaven and be and be able to practice with Visaka and uh, Anatta Pindika in heaven? And if I still can't become enlightened, then may I become enlightened uh, in the time of, of Meteya, the next Buddha. And if I still can't become enlightened at that time, may I be born a Pacheka Buddha and, and become enlightened on my own. Yeah, that last part is important, I guess, because I heard that uh, if you just uh, focus, uh, channel the karma of 
to a focus result, a specific result, like uh, being born in the time of uh, uh, Maitri Buddha. And if you somehow, if you got stuck in some other place during that time, that karma can be defunct or something. Hmm. So if this is not possible, that one. <laughs> right. It's like a failed statement. Well, focusing on what's important is important. Not just being born in the time of Maitreya, but actually uh, being interested in practicing it and being dedicated to enlightenment. Yeah, if, if you just, just say, may, may, this, may this help me at any point, just simply say that then. Mm -hmm. that That's much know. more common. Yeah. I just realized how important it is to have uh, even these types of thinking and thought uh, throughout the day, maybe, and uh, not neglect these thoughts. These mm -hmm. could be re results and so on. Because we often ju just go throughout the day and just not think about these stuff. Right. Well, the Vedic karma will always come forward at the last moment, uh, regardless of if you try to <laughs> cheat uh, the process at the last minute. Like, uh, if you think you can mm -hmm. uh, pick. Well, uh, Garuga karma. Yeah, well, that's the most uh, influential, right? Like, the most strongest, the strongest. Yeah. But if Karuka. you don't have one of those, if you don't have one of those, then the second is the thought. It's the thought. The last thoughts. Uh, uh, not necessarily the last moment. I mean, near, near that karma. Like, it could be like a It has to be a karma. It has to be something significant. Like if you're in a bar fight, or in a gun fight, or in a war, and you're killing people and then you get killed because of the proximity to death, yeah. Yeah, for so, example, Marta Kundali, Marta Kundali, when he was dying, he saw the uh, the radiance of the Buddha, I think, uh, and he, Asadda arose in, confidence arose in him, because of that he was born in heaven. Yeah, whereas a person having that sort of experience during their life, it might not have the same result years later if they die. Whereas what's much more likely to have an effect is the uh, bahu, bahu what's it called? Habitual. Habitual achina kamma. Yeah, achina. Garuka asana achina katatta. So I don't know how uh, how often is random karma giving. That's unpredictable. Result. I think probably probably pretty common. Pretty uh, common. Uh, mm -hmm. if you are have a particular. Agenda if you are karma. helping, you don't have a chance to do any karma during your life, uh, any good karma. So once your bad karma runs out. Uh, the karma from the past life comes forward. Mm -hmm. So the Buddha said that when you abandon sensuality, birth in the womb ceases. Does that mean that birth in the form realm ceases? I mean, birth in the womb can apply only to form birth. Sorry, what's the question? Buddha said that once you abandon sensuality, birth in the womb ceases. You'll have to give uh, a particular quote. It might be a, a mistranslation or it might be a, just a general statement. I don't think womb is ever particularly specified unless it's just a... a figure of speech. So, does that mean that once you abandon sensuality, any kind of words ceases? Uh, right, I guess, no, that's true. 
just abandoning sensuality can lead to birth as a Brahma. You can anagami. All right, I have to go. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>